Okay guys, let's take a look at today's lesson. We're going to look at uh, Taylor polynomials again. And in today's lesson, we're going to look at it from more of an abstract um, way. We're basically going to look at some particulars. Uh, yesterday we learned how to create Taylor polynomials um, where they were centered around different locations. We learned that. Um, and what we're going to do today is take that just a little bit farther. Um, first thing I want to point out is the Taylor's theorem. Um, when we're dealing with approximations, we recognize there's going to be some error in our approximation. And we talked about that yesterday. We learned a technique on finding error. There is something called an error bound. Kind of take your thoughts back to alternating series. When we did the alternating series error, do you remember it was the next term was the bound for our error. We have something similar to that in Taylor polynomials and Taylor series, and that is um, this right here. We have, you probably recognize this from yesterday. This is our uh, formula that generates the Taylor polynomials. Here's our general term. Notice on today's, it's got a plus r sub n of x attached to it. That is, <coughs> as I'm sure you remember from the last unit, r means remainder which is another word for error. So our error has basically a formula or a representation for it, which is listed right here. We're really not going to get into error today, um, but this tends to be one of the most challenging topics for students in this unit is error. So I want to get that out there at first so you can kind of take a look at it. We're going to talk about it several times, and then we're going to kind of dig into it in, in, in a few days. But what this is, this is a next term. That's what this is. If you look at here, this is the next derivative value. That's the next factorial. And this is the next you know, factor, x minus whatever, t the next one. This is like the next term. It has a name. It's called Lagrange's form of the remainder, or Lagrange error bound. And we actually will be working um, in detail with that later. OK, so that's just kind of a um, look into the future on where, where we're going. Uh, just we're going to keep that formula kind of out, out front so we don't become afraid by it. And it's fine. It's just air, just like we've been dealing with. All right. So what we're going to be looking at today is just some, um, some abstract ways to look at Taylor's, our Taylor polynomial. Let's take a look at this example. What we're given is we're given the graph of the actual function, actually what f is. This is what its graph would look like. And then we're given an equation for the Taylor polynomial, the approximation. Now somebody has found this Taylor polynomial. It is a second degree Taylor polynomial, and it's um, centered about x equals 0. We know another name for that. We've looked at that yesterday, the Maclaurin. We could have, they could have called this Maclaurin, but sometimes they use that word, and sometimes they say, you know, Taylor polynomial about x equals 0. You'll see it both uh, ways. And what they're asking is, what are the signs of these coefficients, a, b, and c? if f is this graph pictured on the right, and explain your reasoning. Now, some of you might be able to look at it and just tell me the answer, but that's not what we're, we're working on. We're working on how would we set up the calculus to explain or justify what we're doing. All right. This location right here, the constant, hopefully reminds you of this, what we did yesterday that f of c. So a, in relation to the formula, and to Taylor's formula, is our function value, right? f of c. So a is basically equal to f of 0, right? Because that's where we're centered. If we wanted to find f of 0, and we have the graph, we could just look at the graph. We're uh, focusing on where we're centered at x equals 0. We see the function value here. We don't really know what it is, but we do know that it's a positive number. It's above the x-axis. We do know it's positive. 
So f of 0, and we could call it the y-intercept. That's just additional piece of information. Information. That's the y-intercept. And from the graph, we learn that a is larger than 0. Okay. So our justification or our rationale is simply that a is f of 0. You know, we look at the graph, we see f of 0 is positive. And that's really all the justification we need right there. Okay. Next, let's look at b. b is going to correspond to this second term right here. Now, we're centered at 0, so that part would be 0. That x is this. So b is basically this piece right here. Okay, b is basically f prime of 0. So we write that. So b is f prime of 0. So let's see what kind of information that we can get off of the graph so we can determine what the first derivative at 0 would look like. You know, basically what sign is it? Is it positive or negative? And as we can see, um, knowing what we know about derivatives, the slope here is positive, is one way to say it. Another way to say it would be that the function is increasing at 0. You could pick either one of those. I'm just going to say um, f is increasing at x equals 0. And so therefore, what do we know? If f is increasing, or if you want to write, if our slope is positive at x equals 0, our result or the conclusion would be what is going to, the value of b is going to be, well, actually, let's, let's put in the derivative. So that means f prime of 0, let's build our trail right here. So we know with this information that f prime of 0 is going to be greater than 0, right? It's going to be positive. The derivative will be positive at 0. And then therefore, b is going to be greater than 0. So there's our second value. I mean, we don't exactly know the number, but we know it's positive. The last one is c, and we're going to work it just very in a very similar way. x squared refers to this part, so that's not what we're worried about. Uh, we're going to be dealing with this piece. That's what c is, is going to be, f prime, f double prime. So c equals f double prime of 0 over 2 factorial. That's what our c value is. So we have to think, well, what do we know about the second derivative off of a graph that deals with concavity, right? What, are we concave up, concave down? What's going on in this area right here? And we see it's, it's, mm -hmm, it's, con it's well, when we can look at it several different ways. If we're looking at it in terms of just concavity on the graph, we know that con it's concave down. So that means that our second derivative is negative, right? So we would say that um, f is concave, one, one way to do it is f is concave down at x equals 0 which means that f double prime of 0 is less than 0, right? It's negative if it's concave down. So then that means that c is less than 0. So this is probably the most abstract we're problem that we're going to look at today. The other ones that we're going to look at a little bit more, uh, well, they have numbers in them, and this one doesn't. So that can be a little troubling to some students. OK, is that OK so far? Okay, let's go to our next slide. Here we have, um, we are supposing that the function f of x is approximated near x equals 4 by a third degree Taylor polynomial. So that gives us information, right? You know what that means now. You know, before yesterday you probably didn't know what that meant, but now you know exactly what that means that the Taylor polynomial is centered around 4. So that's where it's centered, at x equals 4. Uh, by a third degree Taylor polynomial. So here's our uh, polynomial. And they want us to find actual values. Now with this problem, it's very similar to the last one that we did. Um, the last one we were only able to get whether it's positive or negative, but this one we're actually going to be able to find the actual number. You know, what is f of 4, etc. So let's do that 
f of 4, if you recall from the formula, is simply the first term of our Taylor polynomial. And we can just read it off of there. So f of 4 is 2. Pretty straightforward. There's our first value. Okay. f prime of 4, as we look up there, it seems like a term is missing. I don't have a first degree term, which should tell us, remember yesterday when we were finding Taylor polynomials, what caused a term to virtually disappear off of the Taylor polynomial? Yeah, if, if the derivative was zero, right? That just wiped out the entire term. So apparently that has, is what happened here. And we need to show that. <coughs> um, so you would write it like this. So f prime of 4 would have been multiplied by x minus 4. And according to our diagram, that term was 0. I mean, it didn't exist. Right? That's what we would have done to get that term. And the term's value is 0. So solving for f prime of 4, we would be able to determine that it was just 0. I mean, if you want to do the algebra, you know, divide this over, you can. Or you can just jump straight to the answer. Okay? Now let's look at Got that one. Let's look at f double prime. So as part of the um, Taylor polynomial, it would have been multiplied by x minus 4 squared over 2 factorial. All right, that's the formula. So according to <coughs> our polynomial up here, that actually is this term right there. So that equals negative 5 times x minus 4 squared. So that's the setup. That's the justification for our answer. That shows the reader where you got it from. So what's going to happen to these x minus 4 squared pieces? They're just going to cancel out, aren't they? And I'm going to solve for f double prime which means basically I just need to multiply both sides by 2 factorial. So f uh, double prime of 4 is going to be negative 10. Okay. Last one, f triple prime of 4 is the one that's multiplied by x minus 4 cubed over 3 factorial. That's that term in the Taylor polynomial formula. That equals this one right here. So that equals 8 times x minus 4 cubed. Just like on the other one, these guys are going to divide off. And I'm left with f triple prime of 4 equals 8 times 3 factorial. 3 factorial is 6, right? So 6, 8, 48. Okay. So that one is very similar to the one we just did. It just has numbers with it. We okay with that? Okay. Part B. Does f have a local maximum, local minimum, or neither at x equals 4? All right. So now when they ask us that, we're going to have to think back about relative maxes and mins and the ways that we can find relative maxes and mins. Now I know the way we probably prefer, I know I kind of prefer, to do the sign chart and test the signs, you know, see if we're increasing, decreasing, that kind of thing. We don't have that option here. We don't have that much information to be able to do that. So we're actually going to have to revert to the second derivative test. Okay. The AP guys love the second derivative test. I'm just telling you. It's going to be on the test. They are going to make a problem where you can't do find the, you know, if it's a relative min or max, the regular way that we do. It's just, it's going to happen. So let's remind ourselves what that test, what, how do you do that test? What is the first criteria of the second derivative test? First derivative has to be zero. Do we have that happening here? Yes, we do. So we write f prime of 4 equals zero. The first derivative is zero. Now, once we establish that the first derivative is 0, what is the next step of the second derivative test? 
the, that's right, we look at the second derivative. We look at, at concavity. Is the, is the second derivative positive or is the second derivative negative? The second derivative is negative, so we write the second derivative is negative 10. So what does that mean? If we're concave down, okay, think about this, we're concave down and we have our first derivative is zero, what is at four? Yeah, our, exactly, a local or a relative uh, maximum. So that's how, we, that's how we answered this question, is by the second derivative test. So you would say there is a local or relative, whatever word you want to use, maximum at x equals 4. Okay? That's a reminder of the second derivative test. All right, last problem. On this one, let's see what we have going on. The Taylor series about x equals 2, so we're centered at 2. Oh, by the way, I have a typo on here. If you'd fix that, this is a 2. That should be a 2, not a 5. If you'd fix that for me. All right, the Taylor series about x equals 2 for a certain function f converges to f of x for all x in the interval of convergence. Oh, that's a great phrase right there. We haven't got to this yet, but it's on every single AP test. I mean, I, I can't think of one that is not on. That is a topic that is surely going to be on there. We haven't, um, we'll get to it in a, a few days, but interval of convergence is a big deal. It's, it's on every test. <clears throat> the nth derivative of x at x equals 2 is given by this formula. Nth derivative. What does that mean? I can figure out any derivative from that formula, right? If I just put the derivative number in there, like if I want the fifth derivative, I'd put a 5 in here and I'd get the fifth derivative value at 2. So they want us to write the third degree Taylor polynomial for f about x equals 2 and they are reminding us about the general term of the Taylor polynomial. So what they've given us is this piece right here, right? That's what they've given us. We have that piece of the Taylor polynomial. That is the formula that's going to generate whatever number from the derivative that we need. So we need the, let's see, what are we doing? Third degree. So P3 of X equals, now our very first term of our polynomial is just the constant, right? F, the whatever, F of 2. And luckily they gave us that. F of 2 is 1. Great. We can all get that part of the polynomial, right? No problem. 1. Okay. All right, the next part is the part with the first degree. So if I want, let's, let's check this out. If I want the first degree one, I would put a 1 in here to get my derivative value. So 1 plus 1 is 2, so we have 2 factorial over 3 to the first. And that is times x minus 2. That's where we're centered. Okay? And it's over 1 factorial, so I'm not going to put that part. All right. The next term... Let's see, this is going to be our second derivative. So if I put a 2 in here, 2 plus 1 is 3, so we have 3 factorial over, that's our second derivative, let's see, that's 3 squared, and then according to our Taylor polynomial formula, that thing has got to go over 2 factorial, and this is times x minus 2 squared. A bit messy, but we'll clean it up. Plus. It's a third degree, so we have one more to do. All right, so we want our third derivative. Let's see, so 3 plus 1, so that is 4 factorial over 3 cubed over 3 factorial times x minus 2 cubed. So let's pretty them up. The first term, 2 factorial, we know that's just 2, so... 2 over 3 times x minus 2 plus. Okay, let's think about this, you know, like being over 1. So we flip that up. We're left with a 3. And you can leave it as 3 over 3 squared if you want. 
a lot of times they write them like that so that you can pick up patterns. That's okay. You don't have to put nine and, and simplify it. Plus, so here we flip that upside down. What do we get? We get a four over three cubed times x minus two cubed. Now, does anybody recognize the pattern? we could get the next term even without going through this formula, couldn't we? Because we see the pattern, how the threes are continuing to increase. One, three, three squared, three cubed, and the next would be three to the fourth. Look at the numerators, this is not totally cool. It's going from one to two to three to four. This is cool, that's a cool pattern. I know, I'm a nerd, it's okay. Um, and we could just generate as many as we want, but we're only supposed to do the third degree, so we have to calm ourselves and only do the third degree. We have to calm down and just do the third degree. Okay? Questions?